Live tonight from the virtual Charlotte Motor Speedway, we say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome to round 11 of the 2020 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series, powered by Boosted. Have a day with us for tonight's Boosted.Club 250, the longest race of this RSR FTC campaign as we welcome you into the Racebot TV broadcast booth. We're alongside our producer downstairs, our junior Kakipati. My name is Evan Pasoko, and happy to be joined by Justin Brents. And it feels like a long time, and that's because it has been just in three weeks since our last points race, as we have gotten through the All-Star break. 10 races down and 10 races left to go in the regular season. Tonight brings us back to NASCAR's backyard. Lots of bump and banging absolutely in the last points paying race plus and lots of excitement in the all-star race. But these drivers are all set to go for what should be an starting start to the second half of the regular season. Lots of challenges ahead for these drivers with the two stopper on the fuel and 250 miles here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. A challenging mile and a half circuit for these competitors tonight. It was a rough one last time out at Martinsville. There's a lot of shaking up at the championship standings, but entering this evening, Michael Laria shows himself at the very top of the mountain. Of course, that with one trip to victory lane now, having locked himself in to the postseason. The only drivers currently in a playoff spot that you do not see there uh, would actually be just the Adam Benefiel in the number 22nd spot. And point, you see Lake Gray in a tie with the Grant Davis. Davis for 20th, the win would put Malik right in should he start 10 regular season races. He has started four so far, is in the field tonight, so has to start six of the next 10 to meet that minimum participation requirement. But of course, now as this season evolves and we continue in, let's talk about this Charlotte Motor Speedway. Just it opened in 1960 by 
Bruton Smith, the NASCAR driving legend Curtis Turner with the running of the longest stock car race in history, the World 600. The Charlotte Motor Speedway closed before it would ultimately become the home track of many NASCAR teams. Just a year after the first race, the one-and-a-half-mile track went in bankruptcy, done in by a huge infield rock formation that ballooned construction costs far beyond what its two founders had forecast. But almost 60 years later, nearly everything is different. There's more than 89,000 seats that ring the racetrack, which was the first super speedway to install lights for nighttime racing. And we will see that here this evening as qualified races off at into the evening. It is an intermediate track. That does not change, but it is going to be high speed action, as I mentioned off the top. 167 laps tonight, actually the longest scheduled distance race of the year. Yeah, and this is a very challenging race, mind you, Evan, as well, because as we talked about, expect to be two stopper on the fuel. That means you need to stretch the tires out for as long as you can. Lots of competitors will have that difficulty of not only staying along the bottom of the track in the corners, but making sure they save their left rear tire because that was a trouble spot throughout these drivers when the official series came to Charlotte. We're about to see, though, how these competitors didn't qualify, Evan. Qualifying down there, loading onto the grid. Let's take a look at your Boosted.Club starting grid. And the best spot goes to Andrew Ferdinand. A 29-184. He will bring us to the green flag this evening alongside the number 22 machine of Scott McClendon. So Daniel Everhart, Michael Lariah going to double up on row two. Those are at third and fourth, respectively. Sam Nieto rolls from P5 along the eight car of Kyle Kamer. Rhett Nichols starts seventh position tonight. Brian and Chambliss eighth best, and it'll be Kyle Trudell and Bradley Burke through P10. Gary Sexton starts 11 tonight with the 29 369 in qualifying. Jared Mogart starts alongside him in row number six. David Washington and Daniel Scott start in row seven with Austin Wagner with a decent qualifying run in 15th. Blake O'Connell, one of the quickest drivers in practice, starts in 16th with Sean Kayla starting alongside Adam Benefield. Thomas George and Trevin Valderrama round out your top 20. And continue it on down through. Final couple of the cars to take times in, in queue include Steve Durham, 21st, and John Fowler, 22nd. That'll be the duo of Jason Lester to Michael Kuczynski through P24. And John Rodden is the last driver to qualify up. But a big name there on the back. Provisionals led by the EDAS car Coca-Cola iRacing Series driver Malik Ray, along with a lot of fast drivers. Eric Stanford, 27th, Joseph Tice, 28th, Steve Soa, Michael Bozier, and Andrew Pelley. Pellegrini 3 with the subpar race city cars at the back 29th through 31st position as the field rolls off at one and two let's talk about Charlotte one and a half mile asphalt surfaced quad oval 24 degrees of banking it is kind of the quintessential NASCAR track and again because practice started late afternoon and we're almost in entirely nighttime conditions just those cooler temps can help out these drivers as well as they do their best in this high uh, downforce and low horsepower package to get these cars around with as little off throttle time as possible. You got to remember though, as the night time progresses from sunset to full darkness, the whole entire feel of the track completely changes. It gets much more slicker and greasier, especially as the track rubbers up. These drivers are going to have to absolutely adapt, Evan, especially as we're about to go green. 10 races down in the regular season and 10 more to go until we go playoff racing. And we're happy that you're spending your Monday evening with us here on Race Spot TV. Pace car down and in. It is Andrew Friedash's field at a turn number four. As we say, let's go racing from Charlotte. We're off the way for round 11. At a lap number one, pole sitter Fernidage maintains up front second and third exchange as it's Daniel Everhart up to the number two position. The first fight behind sees the two of Sam Nieto trying to challenge. It's Scott McClendon stuck up top. 
Here's the problem, though, with trying to run that top line. It overheats the right front and left rear tires a lot, so you want to find your way to the bottom of the racetrack along that blue line as quick as you can. Expect a lot of passes to be set up that way because of how much speed and grip there is down there compared to the middle. And on the board with Kyle Kamer, he is next driver up the inside. As you see, Nieto has actually cleared this battle with McClendon. He has gone all the way up to the inside and around Daniel Eberhardt, who's struggling a little bit that time at a turn number two. You can see Kamer rocketed down the back straightaway, 186 miles an hour into turn three. And once more, the inside line works out. Yeah, but the problem is McClendon just hadn't been able to find some space for a couple laps. He won't feel it now, Evan. But likely in about 20, 25 laps, when you get into the mid in the long run portion of this race, that's where you really start to feel the suffering and punishment for overexerting your tires on a short run. You can see mid pack here a little bit further down. In fact, they've been mid pack just tailing at the top 10. Now these cars are still all together. That's the number 25 of Brian Chambliss on the outside being challenged for the 55. Rhett Nichols in the white and orange Chevrolet on the bottom side of the racetrack. And a lot of these drivers who actually started this race outside line have dropped back a bit off of the get-go. McClendon notably started outside of the front row. He's back into P6 just ahead of this battle. He's got drivers further back down the road trying to work through some traffic. Those faster cars can be trying to take uh, advantage of the field being all on top of each other five laps in of 167. Yeah, some of them were keeping an eye on Benefield. We talked about him. He's just four points out, mind you, of that tie for 20th place. We were discussing at the top of the broadcast. The driver he's racing against in points, Malik Ray, he's in an absolute hornet's nest and nearly just ran with the back of the O2 machine off turn two. And Billy Correa, of course, one of the fastest drivers in this series. Again, only able to commit to a limited schedule for 2020. Needs to start uh, after tonight five of the next nine races if he wants uh, his two race wins from earlier this season to count towards playoff eligibility. Did not qualify, started to P26. And right now trying to pass, that's the 10 of Steve Durham. Oh, but contact as they race for 20th. That was a big hand in a turn two. Yeah, Durham a little bit further away from the wall that time of the contact and bit of a touchback. Contact at a two and then contact again in turn three. It is Steve Durham and the Doppler Durham on the radar car who is into the outside wall and not happy after it looked like Durham was a little bit low, maybe just in sideways at a two. Malik Ray got into him and then he used him up and run down to turn three. Let's take a second look. This is entering one. You see two bits of contact here. Yeah, he was really struggling on the short run and right there you see that bobble. That's what caused him to get in a race door. And the reason Ray's so upset is you get significant aero damage like that on the fender. It slows you down to the straights. Just feeds the dumb, the, the door right back into him. If that move up and into the corner looked like a, a Chase Elliott on Joey Logano move. Just nowhere near making the corner. And Steve Durham not very happy about that one because as Malik Ray was able to drive off the way, you can see Durham now dropping down to the very back, 31st out of the 31 cars who started this race and with some pretty significant damage and the opening 10 laps of a 250 mile race, not ideal. Battle for the race lead though, if we could go all the way up to the very front, there it is, Michael Loria, talked about him earlier, points leader coming into this evening started fourth but he has chased down Andrew Fridaj he's within a car length in the battle for the race lead Fridaj has been in control since this one started yeah, Marias looked really strong throughout this race as well though also looked strong in practice as well all the flat out machines but look at this side by side battling with the top driver on the board in that session Kyle Trudell he's been stuck in this traffic jam of two wide three rows deep and he's been going backwards, so he wants to turn that around. He's currently the blue number seven car in the bottom of the racetrack as he's trying to catch up the lead duo there. The double O of Jared Bogard pushed it up. That's Brian Chambliss's number 25 to the outside. You can see Gary Sexton, the number 13 Ford in the midst as well. So these cars stacked up like they would be on a restart. Great battle, all for eighth position on back at lap 12. 
Here's the thing, though, Evan, with these types of fights, there are two different modes you're, you're basically put towards. If you're in these type battles, you try and get yourself clear and any accept your tires, potentially. Then there are some of the others who are just up the road or potentially at the back end of this train or what some may call big chewing, trying to save their tires, clutch and coast maybe a little bit on an entry and be more calm and save their tires for the long run. Hard to do that when you're in the midst of a hornet's nest like this. Yeah, certainly always easier said than done. And, you know, that's where that experience is going to come in. Uh, of course, drivers uh, who know how to control the car. I was talking with uh, some drivers earlier this evening as well as uh, a bit back of the pack. I think Sean Kalis might have brushed the wall, uh, kind of been pack in the 20s, but no concern there, no yellow. Uh, and we're fine continuing to watch this battle towards the front of the field. But I mean, they also suggest that the tires wear a lot. And of course, uh, uh, this may change with a big build coming to the iRacing service tomorrow. Updated tire model and an updated damage model for these NASCAR Cup Series cars. So uh, tonight, maybe the last race that will look like this ever uh, with a lot changing, not only visually, uh, but kind of underneath the virtual hood as well in time for our next race, which will be coming next week when we go to Kansas. Yeah, we were talk I was talking a little bit with my team about this just earlier today. There's a lot of unknowns and what's going to end up being expectations for how the cars are going to feel with the new tire adjustments come Tuesday, and especially how the car's going to react if you say have significant damage to the front of the car or you break the suspension or break a tie rod and nearly break off your tire. Those are a couple of different things where no one knows what to expect until they get onto the racetrack tomorrow once everything's all said and done. So it's gonna be very, a lot of testing, let's put it that way, for not just the drivers in this field, but for everyone on the service. And of course, it is going to be a learning process. There's nothing to do. As you can see, Malik Ray, in fact, just now forced down to the pit lane. I think his night's going to be done. You can see the right side damage on that car. After the contact for 20th, he was significantly off the pace at his Rowdy Energy Toyota. Uh, he actually started to drop further back as... There is three wide somewhere in the field. Thomas George driving the 19 machine. Talking about that uh, uh, as he's kind of mid-packed or so. But uh, yeah, Malik Ray, I think he got that damage. Started to fall down the running order. His night probably going to be done because I think that car was no longer competitive. Yeah, when you get that type of a hit, Evan, we were talking about this a little bit with this current damage model. If you have more than 10 seconds of damage on the right front or the door, you're going backwards. So you want to keep the car as clean as possible. Otherwise, you just lose your ability to suck up to cars in front in straight line speed. For guys like McClendon, they're calm as a cucumber, meanwhile, with their clean cars. And of course, you can see there's an onboard look with the driver of the number 22 machine, Scott McClendon. Started second, fell back to P6. I mentioned that early, but he has not fallen any further back and is pretty comfortable running behind Kyle Kamer P5 and Rhett Nichols in the number seven spot. And that is the look of determination on board the drive of the 22 Chevrolet as he's maintaining his running order. Yeah, you can see it just on the eyes as well that he's laser focused on trying to at least make his way into the top five while making sure he doesn't burn up those tires as we're talking about. The fall off here is significant for the NASCAR race just a few weeks ago. It was about two seconds. Drivers are expecting that in then some tonight, mind you, with this fixed setup. And you can see the 83 machine there. That is Adam Benefield. We checked in with him a little bit earlier as well as he's one of those drivers. Not that did not qualify. We mentioned some of the big names. Joseph Tyson, in fact, and Eric Stanford, 16th and 17th. The drivers who started 28th and 27th. They're the lead cars who didn't queue. Adam Benefield did. Just not a good queue effort in P18. He is up nine positions. You can see the game the, there actually now as he just sneaks in. Uh, at that plus seven, I should say, in the number 11 spot on the racetrack. So some drivers certainly taking advantage of an early green flag run. And, you know, we were talking earlier, Justin, about what we saw at Martinsville. Obviously, 
an incredibly different racetrack when Daniel Scott got his first career RSR win. That race of its 202 laps had 20 yellows for a total of 102 laps of caution. Now that was an RSR high, an all-time high, and Martinsville has always been known for high caution fly counts, but a lot of drivers very hopeful that this race tonight obviously was going to be different. So far it has as we've got a green flag vibe through 22 of 167 laps thus far. You rarely see a caution flag, flag absolutely, Evan, at this type of racetrack with how calm it can be. But that intensity level's picking up. Battle for the lead. Daniel Everhart had been trying as we saw some other drivers up and on the prowl, but on the inside, he's through a big slide with Sam Nieto. And just as it pops off in the battle for the race lead, the caution flag is out. And there are a few drivers involved. There is the 67 of Blake O'Connell. Uh, but I think uh, the extension is a little bit further and. Eric Stanford not happy on the radio. It is the 19 car where this all kicks off. You can see kind of the tail end of it there. Stanford in a heated discussion with John Rock on the radio. They were battling, I think, for 18th and 19th spot. Justin, let's watch this here as there was contact in turn three. Yeah, you can see just couldn't stick the bottom and just at the same time wanted to make sure he didn't leave the full lane open. Rodden just gave him that little tap, and everyone else just stacked up as they were trying to check up for the incident on the apron. Just nowhere for the back half of the field to go. But the caution flag is out for the first time tonight, and of course, when we saw Stanford get around, he actually saved it. It was that later contact with O'Connell getting into it with Jared DeBogard that actually, I think, triggers the yellow flag here. It's going to be another look on the inside. He gets turned sideways. There's nowhere. For Blake O'Connor to go, you can see Mozart in the back of him. I see Steve Soa in the frame as well. And that is uh, it's pretty chaotic. Boom, big shot. Soa got hit with a 92 car. Uh, that was Jason Lester. So the first yellow of the night slows things down. And your race leaders are down pit road. Assuming the call is going to be four tires in the field. Justin, Ferdinand falling to second. Could he use the number one pit stall here to get the lead back? And a bit of contact on the pit entry, too, mind you, Evan. Daniel Scott and Thomas George tangled up a little bit, making contact with the back end of George. Front end of Scott's car now demolished. But absolutely, take the four tires, take the fuel. It's still going to be very interesting how the window plays out. It's still a two-stopper. And then the drag race off for the pit lane. Farinaj got it. Yes, sir. Daniel Eberhard had more momentum off of pit road. But again, at Charlotte, that yellow line where the green cones are is just feet for the pit exit of that number one pit stall. And Farinaj did have the nose in front, so he flexes that muscle courtesy of qualifying on the pole, and it would be the first car off of the pit lane. Both of Brian Chambliss and David Washington, though, opted not to pit on this cycle of pit stops, or at least on that last trip down, would not be surprised if the 98 and the 25 come in this time. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either, but the reason the 88 came out of the pit lane first, Evan, is there is a strong advantage of being in pit box number one at Charlotte Motor Speedway. We've seen it a lot in the rear world racing just a few days ago. It came in a play where you just have to essentially move four or five feet and you come out right where the commitment cones are here on iRacing. So that puts you right at the head of the field as long as you have a decent pit stop entry and stop. You can gain a lot of positions by just being the pole sitter. You saw those top two come into the pit lane, so that uh, kind of puts a ribbon on that caution to flag a pit cycle, and the running order is back uh, to the way it was on the race off of pit road. Ferdinand's first driver off uh, does have the ability to choose inside or outside on restarts per RSR rules, and uh, he will opt to simply just stay on the bottom line. Uh, that'll put the 90 of Daniel Eberhardt to the outside again. Uh, no uh, rolling of the dice on this time through. Uh, basically, everybody in agreement. Four tires and fuel the way to go. And we talked about those changing conditions, Justin, before every RSR race. These drivers have an hour and 20 minutes of practice. The, uh, you know, atmospheric conditions, the time of day, if you will, in the iRacing service was late afternoon. So when they were practicing, there was some sun on the racetrack. Um, however, uh, we are basically full-time uh, night conditions as we run now. 
Yeah, not completely fully dark, just a bit of orange in the sky, absolutely. But in practice, you mentioned the sun. The more it started to set, the faster the times went. The top spot in practice changed hands about a dozen times in the span of that hour and 20 minutes, just with the changing, changing track conditions. We're about to get back on our way, though, Evan. Race car down it in. It's Andrew Fridage in front. It's a restart. 26 lap down at Charlotte. He's off and away. Seen right you can from see back. from high and above the Charlotte Motor Speedway, Justin, that that 88 machine of Fridas was able to keep an advantage over the Naughty of Everhart. This is the battle inside of the top 10. Once more, car stuck on the outside. McClendon, Kamer, the two cars up top right now. Yeah, you've seen for the back end of Andrew Freenosh's car, Evan, how quickly everyone tried to find that hole to the blue line as talked about. And a bit of trouble in the middle of the pack. Hammer got sideways, that's the eight car. He hangs on to it after there may have been contact between he and McClendon. McClendon bobbled a little bit, maybe Trudell and Banks as well. Now a caution flag from behind. This one though, further down the running order. Uh, and it looks like it may be somewhere in three and four. Yeah, I think the 89 of John Fowler is the best place to go towards Evan because he set up full Bonsai move along the outside line with the checkup. What we've seen with Kamer hitting the apron a little bit. That caused a massive stack up down the back straight away. We can take a look. He ended up smacking the safer barrier, trying to squeeze it three wide when there was two and a half lanes around Scott. You can see they're slow there. That's the number 26 car up the road of Daniel Scott. And uh, that really did not work. And John Fowler does claim responsibility for the caution flag. And uh, it'll slow things down again here from Charlotte, of course, as uh, you can see how this chaos all unfolded on the back straightaway. Here's the onboard look. I mean, there was a hole there, but it closed up awfully quick. And again, the closing rate, I think the biggest thing uh, that I'm concerned about there uh, is what slows us down. And I think now, while well, we have the opportunity under the caution flag, let's see if we can take a look at some highlights from last Monday. Of course, there was no RSR Full Throttle Cup Series action. Uh, but on the off weeks for the drivers here, uh, they are participating in the RSR IROC series. And the season opener for that series was last week at the Daytona International Speedway. Justin, uh, even I participated uh, in that event. And uh, it was, a, I think, a fun way for these drivers to go uh, no stress racing uh, compared to, of course, the uh, thrills and I think the nerves of you know, racing here. So let's check out some of the highlights of that one. And, and that is me in the red I, I did get pole position Justin for the record though uh, I didn't lead any laps I'm surprised you actually didn't lead any laps there Evan I've heard a lot of good things about your racing though but looked like you got a little bit of a squeeze there to start off huh yeah, that was Kyle Kamer on the outside of me, uh, you know, squeezing down because these the IROC cars, which again are just the super late models with a fixed setup. Uh, there was some chaos early, you see. Uh, Brandon Osborne, Michael Kaczynski involved in an incident. So while me and some of the other race leaders sat on the pit lane to get damage repairs, a lot of drivers just went for a quick stop. Again, tires weren't a, nece a necessity, so they just went for the fuel and it kept on going. And that is when we saw Lester go to the race lead for the first time, but uh, it would be a story of some chaos and your race leaders in turn three got into it. Uh, it was a night of mistakes. That's just the tricky part when it comes to super speedway racing though, Evan, especially when it comes to that type of car where you normally don't usually see it these days. It's been picking up a lot of steam absolutely lately though. And it can sometimes be tricky to be able to line up the bumpers properly to be able to make passes, make bumps, etc. And in turn leads to more squeezes and bumps. And you can see a bit of contact there as Pellegrini goes on to on the inside. That's McBride up top, Kyle Kamer in the orange entry. And uh, of course, uh, a late wreck behind as your race leaders had kind of pulled away. Trevin Valderrama turning. I believe that was uh, Scott McClendon there. You can see the big hit for Michael Kaczynski. That would set this race up for a late race decision. Some drivers faking out the decision to come to pit road. Uh, would shake things up late. 
Yeah, and track position in the late going at a super speedway is so huge. That's why a lot of drivers, I think, there may have stayed out there for that situation so they can try and be on the defensive instead of having to be forced to go on the offensive end. And this is the battle on the white flag lap. And, and I told you I didn't lead any laps, Justin. So uh, I'm sure you'll know how this ends for me. But white flag lap, I went out of line from the bottom to the outside. Had an opportunity to go head to head with Jason Lesterman to turn three. But I got a little bit loose there with the push. Got forced down three wide. Uh, I would go on to finish fourth in this race. Tucked back in the bottom. But it was Jason Lester on the bottom. Pushed by Steve Soa, who would go for the inaugural win in the RSR Iron Rock Series at Daytona. That was Kyle Kamer in the orange car on the outside line who finished in second. Uh, again, those races open to all drivers in RSR competition uh, on the off week. So the next time we'll go IROC Series Racing uh, is going to be a little bit down the line. Our next uh, non-race is actually June 22nd, but that'll be a special event for the drivers uh, to compete in in the old 1987 stock cars that are coming to the iRacing service tomorrow. Uh, so it'll be an RSR-sanctioned, non-broadcasted event on the, the 22nd. So the next iRock Series race is going to be July 27th. It'll actually be a doubleheader with Fontana on the 27th. Talladega on the third. Uh, again, we won't be streaming those, but uh, we'll have highlights for the round after that. So uh, just part of uh, you know what we're doing for these RSR guys to have some fun. Am I allowed to race? You're welcome. I mean, if, if, if I'm allowed to race, you're allowed to race. So we'll have you on track next time. How about that? We'll see who's the best broadcaster on the track. <laughs> well, as long as I don't choke it in turn three like I did that time. Uh, I did good. Like I didn't lead any laps, but fourth in points. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take what I can get. And it'll be a very different race, of course, moving them uh, from the super speedway of Daytona to the two-mile oval uh, in Fontana. Uh, but it'll still be a very exciting race. Again, that one uh, in two weeks' time. But back to the task at hand. The second caution flag is going to behind, uh, gonna drop behind us, I should say. And it'll be Andrew Fridage up front some more for the 88 machine. 32 laps down, 135 to go. We're back green from Charlotte. Bit of a checkup, though, on the bottom side. Already near contact there, Evan, heading off into turn one. Yeah, these restarts have been a little bit iffy, of course. Ferdinand is using his control car position to get away. You see Sam Nieto is cleared for second. So the battle is on for third. Michael Loria on the bottom. Daniel Eberhardt on the outside line. As that is the fight, but the inside again wins out on restarts every single time. Eberhardt going to lose two spots now as it's Trudell, the seven to his inside. This is a bit of a panic situation if you're Eberhardt because this is going to be losing more spots. Still can't get to the bottom. Sexton not giving him some breaks. You can see these drivers as well. I mean, they are down on the line here at Charlotte. It is kind of a white, blue, and white line. The apron is actually at the very, very bottom. So if they're on the blue, they're technically still on the banking. But some of these drivers awfully flirtatious with that apron. Of try to get these cars to rotate in the corners. But if you overstep it, it is going to be a harsh transition from 24 degrees of banking to zero on the flat. So you have to be careful with that. But the inside certainly the best place to be off of the restarts. That's why cars up top have struggled basically on all of them. Now, I've seen many drivers when it comes to clipping the apron either snap up the racetrack tight or snap loose and spin out in front of the field. That's where it gets very dicey. A lot of drivers we talked about a little bit before may use it at some tracks just a touch bit for rotation. Here, not as much, especially the amount of bumps here as the track has continued to wear out. Battle for the lead is on. And that's the nose on the bumper with the two is Sam Nieto. He'll go to the inside as Farinaj gets into the outside wall. And a rare mistake for the defending series champion. I'm not entirely convinced, just that he wasn't letting the two-car go. But he got into the outside wall. And that basically made his bed for him. New race leader, Sam Nieto. But for how long? The 88 car going immediately for the counter. Can't do it, though, as the two-car pulls a car length. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Freenosh tries to get any move he can back on Nieto if he's given a shot here. Already pushing a lot on this run already to try and gain back the ground. Clean air is so important here at Charlotte, mind you, because you're able to save more tire. 
and you burn a lot more of it by being in the draft. It makes you a lot more tighter and half you have to be more off throttle in the corners as it lifts up the splitter in the corners. The track position so critical, and I think Andrew Fridaj now knowing how the likes of Everhart and other drivers felt, of course, when we saw Fridaj take the race lead back up front on the cycle of pit stops, then running in second, an awfully lot more difficult, but here he comes, a lot of speed out of four. Nieto goes to the bottom, protecting the inside. Those kinks on the quad oval open the bottom up, should Fridaj decide to be that aggressive. Uh, but again, there is a long way to go in this race, and he backs off for the time being as first and second pull away just a little bit from everybody else on back. Like a Loria third, Brett Nichols fourth, the Gary Sexton P5. This side by side battle, though, just outside of the top 10, it's John Rodden in 13th on the outside line, passed up by the 26 car, Daniel Scott. And I think partly the reason why they're fighting so fiercely in this grouping is, remember Scott ran over the back end of George, that crush in the front nose, bit of contact. And that was David Washington on the bottom. I think he pushed up just a little bit, got into the 33 machine of Ronin, who had been pinching a little bit, uh, but it was a good save by Washington. He hangs on, and now it opens up the door for some more drivers to get into the conversation. The car up top, that is the number eight of Kyle Kamer. Behind him, Eric Stanford, Trevor Valderrama fighting for 19th and 20th, with Stanford winning out in that duo for the time being. So these drivers, admittedly, Johnson, with this package, have had a few opportunities tonight where they have made mistakes, but for the most part, they have caught them. Uh, it seems that they are pretty forgiving, at least this evening, as this battle rages on. As long as you don't severely bobble your way around the racetrack, as long as you keep the rhythm up, you'll be okay. Change for the lead, though. Free notch again up front. On the inside of the two of Sam Nieto, there he goes at a quarter two. Free dodge back to the race lead, and this time he brought company with him. The 44 of Michael Loria also going to move to second. So Nieto falls to third. It was almost worse with Rhett Nichols looking. There's the onboard shot with him. You can see talking with his team, but using the VR goggles. I'll tell you what, just that I had an opportunity to race iRacing in VR at SEMA a couple of years ago on the beta before uh, Rally Cross was released. And it is a whole new level uh, to immersion on an already incredibly immersive service. And Nichols on the goggles there, running up front in P4. Yeah, I personally use VR for my racing as well, Evan, and it absolutely makes a difference to be able to tell exactly where you may be on the racetrack, be able to tell your lines, et cetera, et cetera. It's very important, I think, mind you, to have that visibility, and VR just brings that to a next level. But up front, Lariah trying to move his way up to the next level on the pylon from the second place in the lighting to first. And he thought that he was going to be able to get the two car there again when Nieto kind of initially fell back in this group uh, to third. He was kind of right there on him, ready to go. Look to the inside. It didn't happen. And uh, it seems like Sam Nieto's got his footy to back underneath him. But this is the battle for the race lead that you're watching. It is led by Fridaj, then Loria, Nieto, Nichols, and a little bit further down the road, a battle between Bradley Burke and Daniel Eberhard, who is trying to work his way back through the field. Eberhard around the 95 for P6. Now remember, Eberhard got stuck on the top line for a good two to three laps off the restart. It's going to be questions of how well he's going to be able to save on these corner entries, especially. Because, remember, one of the main things when it comes to not just the pace, but how much these tires of the back end burn is how well you may or may not arc into the corner. Flat corner entries burn up the right front. Wide arcs burn up the right rear slash left rear. Right now, it's looking Everhart is a little bit more on the tight side compared to his competitors just up the line. And we'll see now as, of course, this race continues into the evening and the rubber gets put down if that's going to improve or get worse at all as this thing continues to play on through. Still the bottom, the place to be, but I mean, I, 
I, for all the kind of chaotic moments that we've seen Justin and, you know, some of the incidents with 2 3 Wada getting pushed, but maybe it wasn't necessary. Uh, on the contrary, I have seen a lot of drivers talking on the radio, trying to give each other space as the car dives down to the pit lane as your race leaders cycle on through. That's Jason Lester from a lap down, his night may be done but i mean a lot of drivers have been telling the other cars around them hey go i'm just trying to ride i think they're recognizing that again this race about 50 miles in distance longer than in most of our intermediate races on the year and in 250 miles still not that far it's no 600 mile race but i do think that these drivers are respecting that distance knowing that hey let's just keep these things in one piece for the time being I mean, you look at where we sit now, just barely closing in on what would be one-third distance. I think you hit it on the head with the amount of respect. A lot of these competitors are absolutely thinking big picture with how much they may have burned their tires up the short run and knowing that if they hold the other competitors up, there's a chance that not only do they lose the draft, they hurt everybody else's draft that ends up in turn potentially frustrating them and they end up losing that bit of respect to get that type of patience in the next race or races so it's something everyone thinks about for every single event knowing that there's a lot of racing to go especially with multiple pit stops here at charlotte You can see the top four or five or so kind of log jammed right now, but here's the battle. Oh, and a bit of contact. Bradley Burke pushed by Gary Sexton into turn three. You can see the Donnie five car gets sideways. All of that. Well, Joseph Tice in the number one works on the outside. Another one of those pucker moments, but they all hang on. And that'll actually give the advantage to the outside as Tice wins out in this battle for P6 on back. You also see Trudell McClendon a little bit further down the road. And about a five car pack is again Sexton all over. The 95 of Burke maybe feels like he's being held up and wants to go sooner rather and then later, Gary Saxon had an awfully frustrating night. The last time he was in these Cup Series cars in our Boosted Dot Club North Wilkesboro All-Star Challenge. Looking for some redemption here tonight in the 13 Ford. Yeah, the Bobby Dale Hearns Legacy Esports Machine definitely losing a lot of time here from that. I think partly the reason, though, he's frustrated, not so much the amount of, of being held up, it's the fact that Burke, those past couple laps had moved from the top straight down to the bottom before he started the arc for the entry to hold on to the blue line. And that's where the con reason for the contact, I think, came in. It was why wondering, why are you doing that at this moment of the race? There's still 114 to go coming this time. Yeah, long way still to go, and Scott McClendon still locked in. Last time we checked in with the driver of the 22, he was running P6. Now he runs in P7, so doing everything that he can to keep that car up front. Uh, the car that passed him was Joseph Tice, who's your biggest mover. He's plus 22 spots after not qualifying in this race a little bit earlier on, and that seems to be relatively stable for the moment. The duo of Burke and Sexton, the next two cars behind him. So we'll see if they're able to get up on the 22 and try to fight. Some side-by-side -side further back, the double Majira de Bogar, the Ada Kyle Kamer, in a battle for 13th and 14th position, just exchanged into turn number three. There they are as Mogar tucks in line and tries to get back around the eight, but I don't think it's going to happen this time through. And of course, battling going on throughout here at Charlotte. Lot number 55 now on the longest green flag run we've seen. Want to note something, though, we just seen on the left side of your screen, the positions gained. Joseph Tice, 23 positions gained now. All the way from the back of the field was one of the quickest drivers for Flat Out Motorsports in practice for tonight. has been very strong throughout the season. He's an absolute rocket in front of these competitors. Compare that to Nieto right behind him. And the two is absolutely burned off his tires is losing about a half a tenth to a tenth a lap. He's back to where he started, but that car was very strong early in this race. It again may have used, uh, you know, the fact that he started on the inside of what was row three to his advantage. Better place to be on restarts to make up some of the moves early. 
of the reason Ford Mustang has trickled down to the number six position. And just some updates and some of the drivers out of this race. Blake O'Connell has gone to the garage. He will join uh, Malik Ray as the official DNFs this evening. Jason Lester is on track, but seven laps down in 29th. John Fowler is 12 laps down on pit road in position 30. So some drivers with issues early on in this one, but as the field starts to get strung out just a little bit, Justin, do we dare start to think about pit stops or are we still too far out for that? I think we're still about maybe 10, 15 laps at least from that because we talked about it a little bit. These drivers can make it onto pit stops for the fuel in the tires. It's just a matter of when. The max amount you can go on a run is about 65 laps if you save your tires in the early run. So expect drivers, I think, at about 90 to go, realistically. We'll see a lot of them start to come. And it is also kind of weird, a point that I was talking about some of the drivers earlier this week as well, is, of course, it is not perfect. It is not week for week with this RSR Full Throttle Cup Series only having 30 races compared to the 36 on the NASCAR calendar as there is McClendon around the two of Nieto. So Nieto continuing to struggle as he get passed by both those cars with Bradley Burke following through on the inside as well. But just that, I mean, normally this schedule within about a week or two of its real-life counterpart races follows the NASCAR calendar. But of course, with the delays related to COVID-19 to the NASCAR calendar, and rescheduling and everything, it is really weird to be running an RSR schedule that is really nothing like the current NASCAR schedule today. It's uh, very different compared to what we're used to, and uh, of course, that's for everything on the iRacing service because the official stuff doesn't follow the revised schedules either. As we see a battle for the race lead, Lariah looking to the inside of Fernie She's going to squeeze him tight, though, and not give him some space. Fernie defends for the moment. And that's the tricky spot when it comes to battling for the lead on older tires is the guy on the middle line, if you don't get clear on Apex, get, has the ability to squeeze down and get a run off the corner. We've just seen that with Freenosh. It's going to be an absolute challenge for Lariah. We've mentioned this multiple times. With this package, you want to get clear by corner Apex or else it can be near impossible to complete the pass on such old tires. And that was the look off of the back, basically what Fernidage is going to be seeing in his rear view mirror here as Loria is wanting to challenge. And of course, these are some of the best drivers in this championship. Justin wins, lock you in to the postseason in RSR competition. So Loria locked in. Daniel Everhart locked in. Fernidage with the most wins and everybody with three. He is locked in. So the driver who really needs a W here is Joseph Tice, fourth in line. But the top three have pulled away from fourth on back. It is very much a three-horse race here. And it is not that previous race winners have nothing to race for. Because with every race win you have in the regular season, you get three bonus points to start the round of 16. That could be huge when you look at the fact that, you know, tracks like it is all short tracks, basically. I mean, you got Darlington, a bigger racetrack, but then Richmond and Bristol, I mean, those are all tough tracks. Those bonus points could be huge by the time we get to September. So a lot on the line for these top three. Funny you mentioned the top three and the gap they had on four through six. That four through six group are the quickest cars on the racetrack by about a tenth or two a lap compared to what Freenosh and Ryan Everhart have been doing. So they're slowly tracking them on down when they stay lined up. The reason they lost a bit of time last time by for comparison, because the 55 and 22 went side by side. Take a look at the intervals, went back on the positive after a bit of the scrapping behind them. And I'm just looking at it as well, you know, we had that caution flag. We did see some cars pit. We were looking at the IROC highlights. The highest driver who pitted there was Adam Benefield in ninth. That only gives him about a four or five lap tire advantage. But definitely has been helping him out some, uh, just not a drastic difference. And that's why I think most of the cars stayed out as uh, the fight up in the front of the field continues. Daniel Eberhardt trying to get to the inside of Michael Orion. That's a look back at Adam Benefield in position number 10. He makes his way on a pass, Sam Nieto, who continues to struggle. And as Eberhardt and Lariah enter the frame, you can see it was an unsuccessful look to the inside for the 90. 
Yeah, Varaya trying different things. Now starting to dime in the corner to see if that will give an extra bit of run. The problem is with that maneuver is it ends up in turn sacrificing time on entry in nine times of ten minutes. You balance out the time if you don't execute it perfectly. Now Lariah, back for an air a few laps of trying to set up a maneuver. And he'll try it again. He'll look to the outside. The concern, I think, here for the 44 is, of course, if you're going to try to make a move on Andrew, if you get to the bottom, all the way to the bottom, you probably have a pretty good opportunity to get the race lead from him. Again, a look to the inside, but just the nose not going to cut it. Now, your concern here is if you go in a line, let's go on board here with Daniel Eberhardt. That failed attempt to pass for the race lead it could cost you second because here comes the 90. Lariya was slow at a four. It opened up the bottom, and we get a battle on our hands for second. You can see the beautiful shots out the back in a free notch. This is a good thing for him. It's a bad thing for second and third. It's a good thing for Tice because now it's a four car scrap for this lead because of them fighting so hard up at the front. Yeah, we were clear about how far back fourth place was when we talked about Tice being the highest driver without a win. It was about one and a half seconds. Last time by six tenths, you're on board with P4. One Johnson, we can see with the onboard, he is working hard, trying to chase down Lariah. He's very much there in a four-way battle for the race lead. He just hasn't found a way around that 44 Chevy yet. Make it a six-car battle because McClendon and Nichols have also caught up to this group. They're the fastest cars on the track. The problem is, Greenosh, Eberhardt, and Lariah are about a tenth or two slower, and that's just holding everybody up, it seems. And it's now bunching everyone up, especially behind Araya. He's lost another three car lengths. He's starting to get fairly tight in three and four. And of course, we're on the longest run that we've seen so far tonight, with 40 laps removed for the last caution flag. Uh, so these cars working down to some of the slower speeds. The battle for the race lead is on. Here's the 90 of Everhart to the bottom, his last lap, but a second and a half slower than his best. And this time he did it. New race leader, lap 73. Daniel Everhart finds a way through. Andrew Fridas, who falls to second, not going away though. He's hunted back into one. Remember, Eberhardt and Fridas have worked together in the past, so there's that mutual friendship coming through, knowing Eberhardt was the quicker car. But Tice is now under attack. McClendon just was able to poke his nose right underneath the left rear, just going to get it complete. Now backing it off to save. And again, that's the key here. I talked about this in that battle for second initially when Lariah was the one trying to make moves and that eventually cost him P2 to Daniel Eberhardt. Now, your race leader up in front is that you can't just go for the first hole that you see. You've got to be smart about this. 
And while that battle for the race lead kind of log jammed all these leaders, it has allowed all these other cars into the mix. You can see Steve Durham working his way uh, as a lapped car, but holding the bottom. This could cause issues for Ferdinand because Everhart decided to go to the outside. The 88 stuck behind the 10 as he goes three wide. Close car there as he dives to the outside. That's going to be a little bit frustrating for these leaders. This is really going to hurt tight. And he still holds the bottom. And again, without going right up to the outside wall, Durham doing what he should be doing. And that is just staying low. But the problem is, Justin, that's the preferred lane here. He's on the radio saying, let me go high, let me go high. But there's a car there. He comes up on the 44. Lariah gets into him. And he takes out your third placed car in a caution at lap 75. That was, uh, to quote some of the chatter on radio, unnecessary. Mariah was already try committed to the top line. I'm not sure what Durham's trying to do there to move up there when there's already a car up at the top line for a good two corners. And he was getting beat up there on the bottom line. Of course, he was in the preferred lane. We were just talking about it, and he finally said, let me go high, let me go high, which... I mean, is the admiral thing to do, but as he's saying that, I mean, they're three wide. You're on the board with Mariah here. He can't go down. As it, see the nose of the yellow car there? That's Scott McClendon in this battle. And as Durham's on the bottom right here, sure, he's got room, but he's slow. So as he says, I'm coming high. Mariah's just holding his spot there, and he comes up and squeezed him. Yeah, that is absolutely unbelievable. And definitely a frustrating situation because that just took one of the top five cars out of contention for tonight. That's definitely going to be something Rory is going to be thinking back on. Steve Durham claims responsibility for the incident. He'll get it into the longest line of penalty. Your race leaders are down at pit road for service. Daniel Eberhardt, though, was in front at the moment of yellow. So he's the first car down pit road. But will he lose the battle for the race lead off of the pit lane for a second time? No, he maintains. Eberhardt defending the number two position. It is close in the fight for second. But I think Scott McClendon may have maintained it. Farinage possibly dropping to third in all of this. As you can see, the damaged Michael Lariah entry, who is on to the pit lane. And uh, Steve Durham, very apologetic over the radio. Justin, Michael Lariah, understanding, but uh, as well frustrated because an opportunity for the race win going to be taken away. And mind you, think about this as well. He's been a driver who has sat in the race control seat. Back when the APC United Late Model Series, a late model series in Ontario, was holding E-Series events back in late April and May, he was one of the main guys controlling race control and making sure everyone knew the flow of the race, was bringing out the cautions, etc., admitting the action. So he's in that scenario where he's had to make the calls himself in those types of scenarios as race control. That factors in a lot in how smart you are on the track as a driver. And Durham down to the pit lane this time to get damage repaired. Lights on top of the iRacing.com pace car uh, stay on. So at least one uh, more trip around before we get the one to go. And, you know, typically, Justin, we'd be talking now about the fact that, you know, we're kind of close to the end of this race. I talked about this race being longer than most. Uh, we're going to be in an intermediate next week at Kansas. Uh, basically, all the one and a half mile tracks on the schedule are 125 laps in distance. If that was the distance tonight, this would be the final run to the end. But again, those extra 42 laps change, and I think we're still a pit stop away from the home stretch. And because of the timing of the caution here, too, the strategy's wide open. It's going to be curious of who tries to go split this run up the middle, who tries to run it out on fuel, who tries to short pit. The window is open for anywhere plus or minus 20 laps. It's going to get absolutely entertaining to see what strategy is the best one. And you can see the plus or minus is Tice, your biggest mover in the field at plus 24. And because uh, he did not qualify, however, he would not be eligible for the Doppler Durham on the radio hard charger award. You must qualify, and 
Uh, ironically enough, we're talking about Steve Durham, the title sponsor with that, with his Doppler Durham on the radar Ford. Uh, but $5 to the biggest mover every single week, but you must qualify. So I believe right now that goes to Adam Benefield, uh, who is plus 13 spots after qualifying at 18th. He's P5. Uh, that is only one better than uh, Michael Mosier, who did not queue. So I think Benefield in the spot for that. And, of course, he wants the battle for the race lead in this one as uh, the lights are out on top of the pace car, and we're going to be going green this time by. Heck of jobs for some of these drivers to cut their way through, but take a listen a bit to the, some of the engines there at track level because already some drivers are trying to burn fuel and have their cars a little bit lighter. That gives them more short-run pace. Here's the thing, though. It may tighten up some of the drivers who are trying that here in the mid-run. Yeah, it will be tough. And, of course, you know, now these drivers kind of have to reset everything because they just... And kind of accepted the fact, I think, that, hey, we're in this long green flag run. You saw the sense of urgency ramp up in the battle for the race lead. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, it's kind of a clean slate. Everybody groups back in. It gives those drivers, like Tice, like Benefield, a big opportunity here to get some spots. And, of course, Ferdinaj in third. I think is the lowest we've seen him all night. Granted, he does have the inside line for this restart. That should be an advantage. Pace car off this time. Daniel Auerhart going to control this one from the bottom in the number 90 SK Sim Racing, a bruisey race where Ford Mustang. It's a restart. 80 laps down, 87 laps to go as we close in on halfway home from Charlotte. Perfectly executed start there, Evan, right from the get-go for Ember Hart. But most of the field, again, back to the bottom line. Trouble, though, for Tyson McClendon. They couldn't find holes. And that's the challenge. You can see Ferdinand. He moves into second, so it drops the uh, car on the outside of McClendon to at least fourth, if not more. Benefield passed him. And Rhett Nichols wants to be the next, but Nichols funny with McClendon. A little bit tight that time at a two. The 22 wins that exchange for the moment. A little bit dicey there for the former NASCAR driver. Ferdinand not making it easy, though, with a bit of the squeeze, trying to force Benefield off the throttle doing everything he can to make like difficult and here's mcclendon looking to the bottom as he's gonna go high to low trying to gank a pass for third so benefield hold time mcclendon takes the spot back and for one of the drivers who has struggled from the beginning a 22 car now move in the right direction he's back into third and just like that much the field already single file back out not for long though here comes free nosh He's going to rock it up the inside. Battle for the race lead. Lap at number 83 from Charlotte. No doubt about it. Ferdinand rocketing back to the front of the field. And there is more because here comes McClendon at a drag race to the line with the naughty of Emmerhart. This battle going to be for P2. It's the onboard shot with him. McClendon back to where he started in second. An impressive run for both he, who was struggling on the outside, Justin, for restart positioning, and by Ferdinand, who had fallen to third, the lowest he had been. Impressive that they're both around the Donnie car. Everhart maybe not that good in the very short runs. Yeah, Everhart's been looking really strong on the mid to long run today. Absolutely, I've been worried. He's been able to gain an extra tenth or so in that run. I think he's just saving tires and trying to maybe stretch things out a bit. McClendon, he's not saving. He wants the lead now. He wants to go for it this instant to the inside of Faridage, and he is going to let him go halfway from Charlotte and a new race leader in the Boosted Dot Club 250. It is Scott McClendon to the race lead. Does Faridage let him go there? You're on board with the 88 car.
And these are big laps led for the 22 with Scott McClendon. Justin coming into this evening, he was 18th in the points. Of course, the playoff cutoff, P16, was just two points outside of that spot behind Brian Chambliss in 16th, Bobby Cheney in the middle of them in 17th. So not only would points be big for Scott tonight in that battle, but of course, could he fight for the race win to make the next nine races for him a whole lot easier? It definitely would, especially as well, confidence as a driver as well. They've been able to gap away from third on back. Take a look at how big that is in the backdrop. For the go-kart driver based out of St. Louis, this is one of his best races all season, Evan, with how he's been able to now drive his way up to the front and stay up at the front, mind you, too, whenever he has fallen back in the grid a little bit. When you can see as well, you know, Everhart kind of on his own in third. So will they pull away from the 90? The 90 has even pulled away from fourth on the back. So Daniel kind of a bubble driver. You can see some of the gaps that time at a turn number two. Uh, but I think Farina is riding the coattails right now of the 22 machine to Scott McClendon. Uh, maybe just running around just a little bit again. It didn't really look like that he wanted to put up a big fight in the battle for the race lead. So does he go back at him when the inside opens or... Is this just about hoping that this run goes on for a while and conserving his tires while maybe keeping that pressure steady on the 22 to see if Scott's going to burn up his at the front of the field. Now looking at the one of Joseph Tice, who is in P7 right now. It's basically the best battle on track inside of the top 10. Looking up towards David Washington. Washington a little bit high at a four. As the one car look to make a move. Yeah, and this group is losing about a tenth or so a lap at the moment to the race leader. Two tenths last time, by to be precise. Top three running 30 flats. So they're holding each other up just a little bit. And the more they stay in this line, the more that potentially this grouping is going to break up a little bit. And in turn, be able to try and draft their way up back to McClendon, Freenosh, and Everhart. So I expect a lot of these guys to just stay single file. And know that they have pit stops coming. If you feel like you're faster than a car such as Tice, take that chance, but make it quick. And that was left side tires in the grass, or I guess they should say on the AstroTurf for the one of Joseph Tice as he worked his way to the inside. It allowed him to make the move on the non-negated David Washington. So the spot is his. And a bit of a look back as Bradley Burke tried to go on the bottom, but a swap for the race lead. Scott McClendon had it after 92 laps, but it is Andrew Fridage in front once more as the 88 Ford back to the top of the scoring pylon. And he was doing what I think we both were feeling Fridage was doing was just saving and allowing McClendon to make mistakes and push his own equipment. That was the case, and now, because of how hard he pushed in the short run, burned up the right front. See, right here, pushes right up the racetrack. Everhart, meanwhile, has got a lot more grip to back it up and get these runs to take away spots like this. And this is where it can compile itself, because you can lose two, three spots real quick if you can't get that thing back moving. Daniel Eberhardt, not that long ago, is a full second off of the race lead. Remember, we were talking about the McClendon-led duo. If he and oh, Fredon crash on the back stretch. Way ahead. Moser's around. And a caution at lap number 95. The 54 Moser apologizing on the radio. The yellow came out right away. And we will slow things down at lap number 95. It looks like... Uh, a self-spin and a turn number two that it may have collected some damage on Chambliss. Let's watch. He was definitely trying to let the cars go. Way too high up, though. Just pushed straight up the racetrack. And you can see the other cars behind able to avoid and, of course, obviously not what Mosier wanted to do. Justin mentioned him actually letting the cars go. The opposite of what you want to do when that happens is to get into them, but you can see up and out of the groove, caught the fence there once, twice, and that's just bad timing for the 25 to be there. Yeah, just bad position, absolutely, and bad timing. But for Mosier, seeing why many drivers are avoiding the top line. Back in 2019, it was the preferred group. 2020, you want to be on the bottom because you can get so, so tight if you try to run that line against the wall. But everybody's coming in, Evan. And guess what? 
It's now a few miles race if it goes green from here. Yeah, I'm surprised that it's going to be a unanimous decision almost, but it looks like that everybody in the grand said, hey, maybe we could go on here. It'll be a restart still with about 67 laps to go. Uh, all of your race lead cars down to the pit lane. I think Brian Chambliss, who we just talked about being involved in the incident, uh, the only driver who's not getting service, he missed his pit stall and drove straight on through. So what's the battle for the lead off to the pit lane going to be like? Ferdinage maintains and that small hiccup that last time and he actually lost a spot this time through. He leads and just did it correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm watching Daniel Everhart off the pit road. He was going to beat Scott McClendon off the pit lane, slow down to allow the 22 to be the second car off of pit road because I think he wanted the inside, not the outside. He absolutely did, and I don't blame him, Evan, because we've seen if you are the first car on the outside line, you are losing that spot quickly. Just take a look at this. Good pit stop service up on the left side, Jax. Lots of cars are already zipping on by, and right here came out before McClendon just... Gently slows on down to ensure he's got the bottom line and hooks up with the potential car who can give him a count in rows one and two in the bottom. We saw a similar thing over the weekend. Uh, Chase Elliott and Kyle Busch uh, playing a little bit of uh, a game of chicken on the race off of the pit lane uh, at the race at Bristol to see who wanted inside and who wanted the outside. And that kind of reignited the conversation about a choose cone personally uh, a fan of, of a choose cone rule and Brian Chambliss just blew up for the race lead. The 25 car did not come down or he did come down to the pit lane, but did not get service. He drove through and that car just blew up from the race lead. I think he was going to try and stay out based on what I'm hearing a little bit, knowing it was the fuel mileage race and hoping something happened. But a few drivers were overheating Mind you, on that run, Jared Mogart also blew up with a bit of front end nose damage, and it could spike your oil temps by 10, 20 degrees. And he was upset about it, and, and he's talking about it now over the radio. He felt like that more of his damage was on the side of the car than it was on the front. Of course, front end damage is primarily what you need to be concerned about for rising temps, Justin. Admittedly, I have to agree with him. I didn't see much yeah. front-end damage, but I guess right front is in that area, and nonetheless, that car done after I agree with you. I mean, if he was just going to pit, probably would have pitted the immediate next time by. He was going to try to lead this race, and instead, he's on the hook. And the reason we mentioned the right front damage causing that scenario is it's still in turn right where you have the radiator and remember the aero ducts with this package those aero ducts you cut off some of the cooling for part of the radiator and that in turn i think was absolutely a factor i've had it personally happen where just a little bit of damage on the right front fender temp spiked instantly about three degrees higher for the oil so it moves everybody up one spot, and once more, that means that the race off of the pit lane was the race for the lead because Fridage now back in control. Of course, Scott McClendon ended up second because Daniel Eberhardt let him beat him off of the pit lane. So the 90 going to be on the inside of row number two in third. Will this stand to benefit him long run? Also, a lot of cars on the apron over the course of this yellow flag period. This restart going to be 68 laps to go. Fuel mileage race, Justin. They're going to try to stretch this if it stays green. And it will be one of the longest runs anyone on the entire service has had to make this year at Charlotte. Most drivers I've seen even win saving, like I said, Evan, 67. So it's going to be extremely difficult. Expect a lot of clutch and coastings through some of the corners once we get a few laps in. And we're going to go on board with the number 22 on the outside, Scott McClendon, second to Andrew Friedage, as we go for the restart to take lap number 100 from Charlotte. Going green, the 88 car in control.
Well, it looks like that decision for the inside worked out for Daniel Eberhardt because not only did he go to second, but we saw Scott McClendon drop another position. Benefield passed him for third with the 22 car falling from second to fourth, and he's under attack. That's Joseph Tice behind him. It is battling at the front of the field continues. Tice to the outside as it is Benefield at the bottom of Eberhardt for second. It looks like Benefield getting a bit of help that time, but Tice, we've seen him lose some spots in some of these pit stop sequences, Evan, from having a bad pit stop selection, pit back selection rather, with how he qualified. Back up plus 24 again, though. And you can see the 55 joining the party, but a while since we've talked about Rhett Nichols running seventh. That is exactly where he started this race on 57 to Kyle Trudell on his inside. There's the onboard once more. The One of the drivers who's in the VR goggles in the field here tonight. And of course, that gives you the benefit as we can see the static onboard on the left, Justin. You talked about the advantages of it. You know, a lot of drivers, real world racers, the biggest thing that they struggle with in sim racing is you can't feel the car underneath you. It's hard to kind of immerse yourself and figure out where you are. Those goggles, you can look left, look right, look up and down, and I think that helps a lot with that, but right now he's under fire. David Washington now looking to the bottom. It's going to be a fight for 7th and 8th. It definitely helps with the immersion of being able to feel like you're sitting in an actual car. The feeling portion comes down to what equipment you have in terms of steering wheel, racing seat, etc. The higher up you go, the more immersion you get in those types of scenarios and what equipment you have. But you've seen him with that smirk and biting his lip there. It's white knuckle racing right now around him. He's struggling to get to the bottom still. He's constantly under attack. And all of this, well, Feridaj tries to pull away up front. If we're going to see a fourth or fifth car join the battle for the race lead, now's the time to do it. It seems like routinely over the last two to three runs, it's been the top two or three that have been able to pull away. Feridaj, Benefield, Eberhardt, and that would put McClendon kind of as a fourth driver in that group. So can Joseph Tice take that extra step? He is fourth, but a little bit behind the trio of Feridaj, Benefield, and Everhart, who run one, two, three at the moment. Of course, past halfway. Next time by, going to be 60 laps to go from Charlotte. If it stays green, driver's going to be hard pressed to save enough fuel to go the distance. I'm surprised we're not seeing some drivers try and hold in the clutch a little bit where you normally lift off the throttle on entry. I'm expecting that more and more so as this run progresses, though, Evan. Right now, these drivers are racing like they're expecting their caution flag because that's just been the trends of the race. There hasn't been a green flag pit stop sequence, so they're banking on there being in our caution. Once I think we get to, say, 30 to go, that's where we'll see even more aggressive fuel saving from a lot of these competitors. And of course, I think the reason may be why they don't want to start to save this early in the run, because of course, if there's a caution flag in 20, 25 laps, and you know, you may be giving up positions now, it kind of goes all for nothing, because if we see a yellow, cars definitely get a pit, not just for the security on the fuel, but kind of primarily for the tires. So a lot of the time when you have fuel saving strategies, as we look a little bit further down the running order, that's Kyle Kamer passing the O2 of Trevor Valderrama for 14th and 15th. And you might think, well, why are you, you know, waiting to the very end of the run to save your fuel? Of course, if you do it too early and the yellow comes out, you're kind of giving away track position and slowing yourself down free of charge uh, against the other cars. Is uh, Next up, Austin Wagner searching to try to get to the inside of the O2 now for 15th. And we're still at that point of the run, too, where a lot of these cars have to go near full throttle on entry to maintain pace. It's around 15 to 20 laps into a run is where you start letting the car roll in a lot more or else you burn up that right front or left rear tire. There's the onboard look with the driver of the O2 machine is... He's got the 14 of Austin Wagner to the inside right now. Seems uh, pretty cool and collected at the moment. Uh, not a lot of radio chatter out of him compared to the likes of McClendon and Trudell, who seem to be on the mic all the time throughout the race. 
Yeah, having a bit of communication now with some of the cars, and especially Wagner underneath them. But he's been more on the conservative side. I've noticed this run with the throttle inputs. He's actually been getting off the throttle a little bit more compared to some of the air cars. He might be thinking that big picture at this moment and trying to see if he can try and luck himself into a good call. And he's doing real good, of course. P15 above the average finish for the O2 cars. He falls to 16th. Again, his kind of memo here is just kind of keep it clean and, and try to continue to learn as one of the several rookies in the field for this 2020 class of the RSR Full Throttle Cup Series. That is John Rodden now working his way around him on the inside. The next battle I see on track is Gary Sexton and Rhett Nichols for ninth and 10th position. And you can see that group at a turn number two right now. Sexton on the bottom of the 55, about two seconds and change off of the race leaders as Sexton gets the job done on the bottom. And we're seeing plenty of give and take throughout this run already. Speaking of taking, Leach has been taken away by Benefield. Yeah, but the very front of the field, Adam Benefiel, and kind of out of nowhere, it had been free dodge comfortably. We saw Benefiel, Eberhardt, and Tice, actually, who caught that group running behind the 88, but free dodge was just a little bit slow, and his exit at a turn number four, and it was such a bad exit that he got passed up by both the 83 and the 90 in one swing of the bat. We have seen many times tonight Andrew Ferdinand lose the race lead, get in line, ride around for 10, 15 laps, and then just go right back at him. We'll see if this remains true, but with more cars justed in the conversation in this lead group here, uh, he may have his hands for full now more than ever. As let's see if we can get a second look at how the 88 machine lost that race lead. Yeah, you're going to see it off a turn four right there. Just Benefield gets that major run. Normally you see only one car pass, but this time backs right off the throttle, and man, what a squeeze by Freenosh. Just came right across nearly the nose of Tice to find the open hole and get himself back to the bottom so he didn't drop to the back end of those lead pack. Hey, that was an awfully gutsy decision to squeeze his way in. Joseph Tice may have cut him a little bit of a break there as to not uh, get into him and uh, for the moment, it pays off, and uh, now actually Benefield pulling some distance at the front of the field. Eberhardt could be on the chopping block if Fridosh feels like he needs to go, uh, you know, without dropping further back. But, uh, you know, we really haven't seen a single race leader pull away. We've seen a group of two or three or four get away. Right now, the lead six cars are all within one second of each other. Uh, even if Adam Benefield goes on to win this race, there's 49 laps to go. That's still an awful long ways left. I don't think he's going to run away with it. You're going to be dealing with pressure till the end. And I think we've both seen in the past, though, that Benefield can handle pressure. We've seen it at Daytona at the start of the season. We've seen it in his time in the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. He can be calm, cool, and collected. He's in the driver's seat where he can do that right now. Just has to be able to manage the pressure from behind, especially since there is no one in front of him, mind you, even lap traffic for a good half a racetrack. Kind of comes and it goes as we're on board here with Adam Benefield, your race leader. One moment, it looks like Daniel Everhart is about to get on him for the race lead. The next moment, he's dropping back. And there was, as well, some contact back in the pack as uh, the two of Sam Nieto got into it with Gary Sexton. Sexton threw a block 
down the back straightaway. Sam Nieto wasn't happy about it, went off into turn number three and moved the 13 car out of the way. So the two and the 13 going back and forth. And uh, that disagreement continues now on the radio with uh, a couple of phrases I can't repeat. Yeah, and I don't blame a little bit of the feistiness in this. We'll see this from the lap before where Nieto's a good few car lengths behind. Sexton getting fairly tight in this run. And right on the next corner exit in three is where Nieto starts to really close on in and focus up in this battle. So we'll see if anything else comes from this group. This is all battling from outside of the top 10. And here it is. So there's the block on the back straightaway. And Nieto said something to the effect of don't block me. And then watch this in the three. Uh, he's going to move up the hill and nudge Gary Sexton out of the way. That uh, is what the 13 took exception to. Yeah, you can put up the air quotes for a racing incident there, I have to say there. And Nichols nearly showed his bit of frustration with that move on Sexton a bit there. Nearly nudged him in three and four. All of this about three seconds and change behind the battle for the race lead. No changes there. And of course, the full running order is still at the top of your screen. So not missing anything up at the front of the field. Uh, Sexton may have gotten some damage, but I would keep an awfully close eye on the 13 and the two should they find each other once more. 43 laps to go this time by. You got drama at the top, but in the middle, all throughout the field. Here at Charlotte Motor Speedway is starting to close in on the end of this boosted Dot Club 250. 11th round of the 2020 Real Racing Full Throttle Cup Series. Our coverage tonight, as always, is powered by Boosted, the place where gamers and creators go to monetize it digitally. Their team will build you a totally free e-commerce store and help get sponsorships for those looking to build the brands. Go to Boosted.club for more info. As this is going on though, Evan, you can tell this lead pack again has calmed down just a little bit. It's a matter though of how long it stays calm. There hasn't been too, too much fuel saving as I think I may have expected here in this grouping. They're pushing like they're expecting they can make it to the end here. Like we said, it's going to be tight. And these big clusters of cars, I have to imagine, Justin, is going to make it more difficult for drivers to save because if you're constantly fighting, you can't really focus on conserving. Not as much as you think if you try to go single file, you can use the trap to save fuel. But compare that to, say, fighting side by side multiple times where you're trying to smash the throttle down to clear by somebody, that's where you use a lot of the fuel here. You go maybe half throttle instead of full throttle on some of the corner exits. Try and be more conservative on how much you go in thr back in the throttle on corner apex as well as you get off the gas for corner entry. So there's ways you can do it while maintaining positioning. But if you feel a lot of pressure where they're side by side, that's where I think drivers are going to start panicking. Inside of 40 to go, monitoring things as race leaders are going to catch up on some traffic. We remember the fireworks that time, or last time that happened with, uh, of course, the uh, the issues with Steve Durham, who's made his way back to the lead lap and just doing his best with the damaged car. And uh, Jason Lester's the one up the road saying, I'm going to go high, give the race leaders uh, that preferred position on the bottom line. Is there you see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and... I'd even include Bradley Burke in the conversation a little bit further down the road in seven. All I think with a good chance to win this thing. And Lester struggling a little bit, it seems, on Apex off. A little bit lower than I think some of these cars may have been hoping. I think he's going to be out of the way, though. And you can see the advantages, of course, none of the race leaders were side by side at the moment. So that helps as well as it, it keeps it at, at minimum. 
a two wide situation of course uh, it can get a little bit more sketchy like it did in the case of steve durham there because those lead lap cars were actually battling with each other while they were trying to get around the lap traffic and of course that really only further complicates things uh, in these situations but 36 to go. I'm continuing to watch the number to see if I can notice drivers being uh, any more conservative with the, you know, aggressiveness and trying to save. And admittedly, the way these cup cars race, Justin, when they are, you know, so uh, kind of momentum dependent, is it, it's hard to save fuel. And, you know, as long as you aren't fighting, maybe being in one of these groups, that is single file, as you noted, could help if you're towards the back. Yeah, we were talking about it with, with Kyle Trudell specifically, for example. He's not been able to get any runs on anybody, but I don't think he wants any runs on anybody. He just wants to stay single file. I think games are getting feisty again back in ninth. By the way, Trudell was clutching coasting. We were talking about with the seven. And it's going to be tricky to do again. He's P6, so he is the very back of this lead group. So... This is kind of the spot to do it. Let's go on board. Kyle Trudell as he runs in the number six spot. hear exactly what I was talking about there, Evan, with the clutch and coasting. Every single quarter entry, letting it roll for about three, four seconds, then getting back on the gas. The downside is it burns up the right front a little bit with how much speed you're carrying more on quarter entry. Some drivers talking over the radio as maybe pit stops for the likes of David Washington and others. He and Sam Nieto on pit road, they don't think they could make it as they pit with 32 laps to go side by side down pit road and could this influence more cars to come in michael bozier on the radio saying he's going to come down to the pit lane certainly if pit stops need to happen the first couple of cars down going to have a big advantage immediately and on that fresh rubber first yeah but this is also the gamble where you're hoping that the fuel doesn't last for the guys like trudel who are clutch and coast and you're going to try and stretch it Here's the thing, though. They're going to be losing a lot of time by trying to save the fuel already nearly two full seconds, as we talked about, on the fall off on these tires. One's coming in. And that is P4. Joseph Tice, the number 26 car of Daniel Scott, says that he's going to come down to the pit lane, but I think Joseph Tice admitting that he can't go as he slows it down to pit speed here at Charlotte of 45 miles an hour is the and the first major indication that it is not going to happen to Joseph Tice's decision to be the first car down. Oh, but he missed the stall. The one car, not even close, overdrove his pit stall. And I was about to say, Justin, this could be a race winning move by Tice from only three tenths off of the race leader to come in first. And uh, he lost. There it is, backing up. I mean, that's at least six, seven seconds. That throws that whole strategy out the window. Taking our look right here, and you'll see trying to line, was trying to line up that pit box. Now, at least a few seconds lost, as you talked about. 41.7 seconds in the lane. Mind you, the average timing, about 37 seconds. That's an eternity still on the track. And you can see as he blends back up on the bottom of the racetrack, uh, he may not even get a net lead out of all of this. As funding continues, that is the battle between the 90 machine of Daniel Epperhardt and... 
Uh, Andrew Fridage off into one. Just uh, a little bit up the road is race leader now, Adam Benefield. Mm -hmm. Speed Dynamics entry back in control at lap 140. I have to think, though, with that decision to pit from the one, Justin, do these drivers think they can make it? With kind of everybody diving to the pit lane at once, they almost, you know, assumed that they all kind of had accepted that they couldn't make it, but with not responding and pitting, maybe we are not all in agreement. Yeah, I think some drivers absolutely feel like they can stretch it maybe to the very edge of the fuel tank. We see that a lot with Trudeau. He's been saving a long time. Looks like Eberhardt, he's now backing it down. He was backing it down a fair bit when he was in second spot, mind you. More drivers say that they're going to be coming to the pit lane, but they are not the lead cars from Charlotte. The first car who pitted, David Washington. Remember, we saw the 98, the two car demo down to the pit lane. Well, uh, David Washington's the net leader in all of this. In fact, he actually just got past. There it is with Sam Nieto. This is the battle for the first spot, one lap down, P20 on track. They are both ahead of Joseph Tice. I think a lot of that is because Tice threw away so much time on pit road, but this could be a battle, if not for the race win, a battle for a good finishing position, depending on how all this plays out, as now Washington takes it back from the two. A look at the damage on the back end of Sam Nieto. It looks like he got probably walked up from the back end of somebody, and that's like a parachute with the amount of damage on that car. That's really going to slow him up, and now lap traffic getting in the way. A lot of it there that sexed in on the bottom. Again, these are lead lapped cars that are the lap traffic, of course, slower on the old rubber. Let's go on to board with the one. Always oh, into the outside wall. That was Tice who drops to the apron to hang on. No yellow. We stay green as the 13 and the two. We remember the incident that happened earlier, Justin, after it was Nieto who hit Sexton. This time is Sexton pushing up into the two, possibly retaliation, but instead he caught the one car, not the two. I don't think that was intentional, just pushed up the track and it ends up collecting both of them, losing tons of time. Tice getting the worst of it, obviously, with that hard smack to the outside wall. The no yellow, but of course, uh, the one at Tice not happy because he was not a part of the initial contact that that may have had a part of. Battle for the race lead. Lapped cars on the outside. Slow race leaders on the bottom. Benefield closed in by Feridage. It is now McClendon up to third as he makes the pass on Daniel Eberhardt. This is the most terrifying part and the risk of coming in for a pit stop too if you're expecting this to go green the rest of the way. The massive differences in tire lifespans, Evan, can cause potential crashes in contact. Nearly happened there the last time by in this corner. And still the race leaders not pitting. They seem to be committed to this decision to try to save fuel and go the distance. It is a four-way battle for the race lead now. Benefield, Fridage, McClendon, and Everhart. One, two, three, four. The next time by, it'll be 20 laps to go. You ride with the 94. Contact right there as that was Everhart into the back of McClendon. He apologized over the radio. Fight for the race lead up the road. Ferdinand looking to the inside on Benefield. Side by side at a turn four. A little bit of a squeeze there. Benefield not giving too much space to Ferdinand. One of the top drivers in RTP points. 
And he is really making him squeeze down on the inside line. And for the moment, it pays off because Benefield stays in front. Now here comes Eberhardt. Just past McClendon. Now to the outside of the 88. And a battle for P2. He's going to have the runoff of the quarter. There is faster lap traffic, though, entering the picture. Here comes David Washington, the lead car on fresh tires. Can he find a way through? Looks like, yes, that's a smart move by all the lead cars. Move out of the way quick. Allow Washington to zip around the top. And you can see that's where the lap traffic finds the way through. It almost pins Benefield to the bottom. Now Everhart going to get to that outside for the race lead. Slow on the entry to turn number three. If he can keep a nose there on exit, he's got an opportunity. And here comes Eberhardt, side by side with Benefil for the race lead. Ferdinand watches from third, that time at 17 laps to go. They got more traffic ahead. This time it's Kuczynski in the 30. And this is now slower traffic. They have dealt with faster. Now they're going to do a slower. Kaczynski over the radio says, I will stay high. But it does affect a little bit. Benefield and Frenaj not being able to go up to the outside wall on the exit at a turn number four. But Daniel Eberhardt to the race lead at lap 152. Now it's Frenaj trying to go on the inside of the 83. It did not work that time. Don't forget about the fourth car in this group. That is Scott McClendon looking but not making a dive yet. And McClendon's done a very good job keeping this run conservative and not burning up the right front like the last run. He's got a decent shot to try battle for this lead if he plays his card right with under 15 to go. And I mentioned it when we saw what looked like maybe Benefield trying to pull away about 20 to 30 laps ago that it's just not going to happen. We've seen groups like this pull away tonight, maybe four a piece at most, but we have not seen a single car get away. And yes, the clean air is an advantage, but it has not been an end-all, be-all. Daniel Eberhardt is going to have his hands full at 14 laps to go. His advantage, only a single car length. Mind you, McClendon's not saving as much compared to the start of the run. I think he feels like he's confident he can go the rest of the way. He's now in pushing mode to try and make his way to the bottom. And you can see, I think Farida is going to be the most aggressive one here. Benefield dropping back just a little bit. Here comes now McClendon, the 83, back the 88 car up. And McClendon going to benefit. He goes to the inside for third. Not all the way clear. Nearly went to the inside of Benefield at the same time. But Andrew Farina himself with the fourth, the 83 struggling again. Really tight that time at a two. Here's McClendon to the bottom for second. And you can definitely tell the tire's much more safer and more cooler for McClendon. I think he's got a shot to take away this lead here if he plays the cards right. Just needs to get another big run off the corner. Oh, and he's way out of control now. Benefield slow. He is onto the apron and as slow as he had a fuel. No, had contact with Freenosh, I think, in the middle of the quad over 11. There was the contact that he got sideways, but I didn't see him throttle back up. He just opted to stay on the apron, probably the safe decision. Instead of immediately pulling up onto the banking, he is under power once more. But Adam Benefield eliminated for the fight for the race win. Here comes Scott McClendon. He's on the inside of Everhart, and he'll go to the race lead with 11 laps to go. Now it comes the question, how much does Everhart push? Remember, he's been fairly conservative as well in this run. He's been in the clean air, though, for the past few laps. You can definitely tell at this point, Evan, with the amount of blocking we're seeing right there from Everhart, 
he feels any lap traffic could cost him this time it might help him yeah, that was the 55 machine on the bottom he nearly got tagged by Rhett Nichols who's the first car a lap down trying I think to work his way through Nichols is on fresher tires but is caught in the middle of a battle for the race lead and it does help him because now McClendon's advantage over Everhart about four car lengths yeah, but here's the problem. McClendon has to give up that bottom. Here comes Everhart, backing up the corner, trying to build up an air big run. And now that the 55 is through, he is unobstructed. Two car lengths the difference that time by. It was eight laps to go from Charlotte. Should these top two come to blows, do not forget about Freddy Dodge. A half a second back as the 90 looks to the outside. Massive run here. Has to be really focused, McClendon, at this point. Everhart trying the top side for the lead. He got the nose there to turn number three. You look at Scott McClendon. He is working hard, searching for a first race win of 2020. But Everhart, the nose in front to turn number one. They are dead even door to door for the race win at Charlotte. But at a turn two, the run gives it. Daniel Everhart goes to the point. Next time by, six laps to go. Can Scott McClendon counter? Oh, and Everhart getting a bit tight now off the corner a little bit. McClendon now has the chance to draft by. He's going to draft right up and onto the bumper. The 90 used the outside to go to the race lead. What would Scott McClendon's choice be if he can get there? Would he go high? Would he go low? You can see behind, Fridaj just kind of left the picture. There is another lapped car, though, as well. Steve Soa, significantly fresher tires, is trying to safely tiptoe on to buy on the outside. Not sure he's going to commit to it. This time by, going to be five laps to go. He may just lay back to let McClendon go at Everhart. Yeah, I think that's the smart move. He's been holding up Freenosh just a little bit. That's how Ma that's why Freenosh lost five, six car lengths in the span of 10 laps. But in the next four laps, McClendon's got to find a way to close back up this gap. I think he's trying to save for one last burst of speed. Of course, you mentioned the fact that Scott McClendon looking to 4A race win. Daniel Everhart, of course, race winner earlier this year. And a similar race track, the one and a half mile for round three at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Looking for, again, on the line for him, three additional bonus points to open the round of 16, and he is pulling away at a turn number two. More drivers back in the pack, continuing to trickle down pit road. If the leaders were to run out, David Washington in 11th would stand to benefit. But with three laps to go, they are so close to make the fuel strategy work as it's a huge run for the 22. And now McClendon's backing off all of a sudden. Maybe too much of a burst. Wasn't going to be able to make the move there if he stayed on the back bumper. And on the iRacing service, these drivers know exactly how many gallons left they have. It'll also give them an estimate on how many laps that is going to last. Can they go the distance? If they can't, it may not even fall back way to Washington. Somebody outside of the top two who hasn't been in a big battle may have had an opportunity to save more fuel. That time by, it was two laps to go. The game had checked it up front in a battle for the win and the fight against the fuel. And I think with the way these drivers have been pushing, it's going to be right down to the final straightaway. It might come down to some clutching. McClendon really backing it down off the corner. He's out. He is really slow. He's out. Scott McClendon's not going to be able to make it at one and a half laps to go. The 22 car is forced down pit road. White flag for Daniel Eberhardt. This race is official. Now, does Eberhardt have enough fuel is going to be the major question here. Andrew Fredidaj, just seven tenths of a second off if the 90 machine can make it the rest of the way. They have been on these tires and as well on this fuel for some as 70 laps, but he's in the power at a turn number four, and he's gonna have it off. Daniel Everhart captures the fuel mileage win from Charlotte Motor Speedway. 
What a finish to this race. We talked about how close it could be. Well, it came down to the final moments. I think Everhart ran out just as he was crossing the stripe. He is coasting down the back straight away. We may not see any victory burnouts from the Dotty Ford as he was unable to make the distance. Scott McClendon still trying to get to the end of this race. He will probably finish last on the lead lap and about 12th certainly could have been a lot worse, but that just goes to show you how tight this thing was on fuel. In the end, your top eight cars did save enough fuel to make it. David Washington, the lead car who pitted in that run, uh, finishes in P9. And that's uh, that's the burnout you're going to get. As he's got a little bit left to celebrate. Just a little touch. And I... Still surprised he's able to get as many burnouts in and donuts as he can. There it is. That's it. What a run. Out of gas, he says, as it skids across the start-finish line. Second win of 2020 for Daniel Eberhardt. Let's take a look at your Boosted.club full race results. The place where gamers and creators go to monetize it digitally. The team will build you a totally free e-commerce store and help get sponsorships for those looking to build their brand online. You can go to Boosted.club for more information. So Daniel Eberhardt's margin of victory, eight tenths of a second. Over on Andrew Fridage, again, your top eight finishers from Everhart through Benefield saved enough fuel to go the distance. David Washington, first car who pitted on that last run in P9, along with Rhett Nichols in 10. 11 spot, John Rodden with Scott McClendon coming away 12, 42 seconds back. The last car in the lead lap after he ran out of fuel coming to the white flag. Sam Nieto comes away in 13th. Daniel Scott, 14th. With Austin Wagner in 15th. Joseph Dice involved with tra flat traffic incidents. Finishing 16th. Kaczynski, Kalist, Mariah, and so on. Round out the top 20. And continuing on through, it's not a year top 20. A lot of these cars were still in the race. The likes of Ozier and Durham, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, quiet nights for Lester and Pellegrini up at the bottom uh, four or so. Basically, uh, actually five. Chambliss down through Malik Ray, uh, unable to go the distance in this one, and they will DNF in the Boosted.club at 250. It's a look top the bottom at your Boosted full race results. We will take a quick opportunity to step aside, and when we come back, we will talk with your top finishers, where Daniel Everhart's a race winner on Monday night once more. He wins the Boosted.club 250. Post-race action is next. You're watching Race Spot TV. The field is rolling out for the start of today's 400 lap race on this 0.625 mile racetrack. Here's the starting lineup on the pole from Dustinville, Georgia, in the number nine Coors Ford qualifying at the Winston Cup race from North Wilkesboro is underway. Everybody nicely through turn number one and two as Bill Elliott has the lead and Dale Earnhardt has jumped into second position, followed by Benny Parsons and Bobby Allison. Bill Elliott straining 
And back live from the virtual Charlotte Motor Speedway, where RaceBot TV's coverage of the 2020 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series, powered by Boosted, continued with tonight's Boosted Dot Club 250 from Concord, North Carolina. Happy that you're with us for some post-race action. Evan Pasoko, Johnson Prince, along with our producer, our junior Conky Potty downstairs. And we're going to talk with your dot finishers beginning with your race winner tonight, the driver of the number 90 machine. Daniel Eberhardt wins this one on a fuel run to the end. Daniel, congratulations. But it was not just a fuel run because you had to battle with about five, six other cars throughout it. Talk us through that run to the end. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Me, Andrew, Adam, and uh, Scott. Uh, I was just kind of pacing myself this whole entire race. I mean, uh, my tires were really good at the end of runs. And, you know, I thought for a minute there at the beginning of the race, we were going to have a full stretch on fuel for a run, and we didn't. So we didn't really know what we had. I never made any long runs in practice or anything like that. So I uh, just worked on saving tires, and then it came down to fuel mileage, which makes it a little bit more exciting with the low horsepower that we have because it just makes the car so dull and uh but it was really fun racing at him and i knew if i could get to his outside i could probably pass him but then scott just came out of the middle of nowhere but i felt like he was really really running real hard and burning his fuel up and we saw of course he was unable to make it ran out of fuel uh, with about a lap and a half left to go in fact coming out of turn four looking for the white flag about half the field actually more opted to just come in and pit we saw the top eight were the drivers who were actually able to save fuel to the end was that at all being considered to come down pit road or, or were you 110 percent committed to stretching it out uh once we restarted and, and we kind of knew if it stayed green it was going to be tight no we actually thought about uh topping off but uh we didn't and then i committed just to saving fuel like you said and I just kind of saved fuel all the way coming out, all the way out of four, and then shifted down into second, and just went on with it. But it was uh, it was tough, and and you know, a lot of people say you clutch or switch the ignition off, and I didn't do any of that. I just drove normal, but I backed up my corners a little more. I didn't, you know, pushing the throttle down real hard burns a lot more fuel too. So just rolling in and out of the gas, and just being consistent. That's what really helped me to save fuel and Andrew save fuel. And I thought Adam was going to be up there, but I think him being out front and us drafting off of him and then Andrew drafting off of me helped save even more fuel. So we're kind of golden if you think about it. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because, you know, conventional thinking would suggest, okay, well, you're fighting for position. That's going to make it more difficult to save, but actually kind of the draft of being in a group seems to have benefited there. Uh, of course, second race win for you here on 2020, and uh, you got that race win a little bit earlier in the year, uh, I believe, when we were racing at another intermediate track at Atlanta. So uh, you seem to have these one and a half figured out. Uh, do you feel like that'll help you out once we get to the playoffs or – uh, is that maybe a point of concern that you want to work on getting better at some of the other tracks too? Yeah, I like the D ovals. I don't know why and why it fits my driving style, like Atlanta and uh, Charlotte and Texas. They're all kind of the same. So, oh, like Kansas, we're going to, and that track's a little bit. It's kind of weird. It's not really a full D because you make a circular round and it's not like squared off in the corners through the tri oval. So, uh, I don't know. I mean. Charlotte's not in the playoffs, you know, Texas is, but uh, I just don't know because the Rovals, you know, it's hard to say. There's not as many D-shaped oval tracks in the playoffs like there used to be. If I would we go back about three years ago, I feel like I, I'd be in pretty good contention, but having a road course in there kind of throws me for a loop. Yeah, just take into account, look, I think uh, only three of the ten are actually kind of your conventional conventional one-and-a-half-mile tracks. Uh, but, of course, second win, you get some more bonus points, headed off it into the uh, the postseason here. Uh, we've now entered the second half of the regular season. Knowing that you have the win and that, of course, getting more will, will kind of benefit you, did that influence maybe tonight's decision? I mean, does that allow you to kind of, kind of take more risks to go for the win and, and, you know, not think, you know, maybe I should just – be happy with a good finish are you able to kind of gamble oh for sure gambling is a part of the game once you have that win you have no worries it's left high on the wind you can you know, there ain't no surrendering pulling out the white flag uh no uh if you can go for it uh, it gives you the right to go for it and uh 
you know, even me being up there in points, you know, it, it, it makes everything just a little bit more relaxing throughout the year. And then you can, you know, kind of shoot around and throw darts in the water, trying to see if you can hit on something at certain tracks that you're not really good at. So it makes it kind of fun. Then you can be a kind of a bigger help to your teammates, you know, kind of help them throughout the season and help them get good finishes and work with them and try to focus on them. So, so you know, getting this win pretty early in the season really helps out. We'll let you get out of here, but Daniel, congratulations on the race win tonight, and uh, we will see you next Monday. All right, buddy. Thank you. The race winner tonight, the Boosted Dot Club 250, will continue down to the pit lane. Justin Prince standing by with our second and third place finishers, but it starts with P2 tonight, Andrew Ferdinand. Yes, indeed, Andrew. Heck of a battle, mind you, to be in contention for this win tonight. Multiple lead changes up at the front. How are you feeling coming away with P number two tonight at Charlotte? Honestly, Justin, I feel uh, great. I really don't um, like this kind of, of racing with the, the low horsepower and whatnot. And I was able to use the iRacing AI here to run a, a whole bunch of practice races. So you know, I was very, very happy to get second and even be in contention for the win. So, you know, most people second is disappointed, but I was uh, I was just happy to be there. That's actually one of the first times I've heard someone use the AI as a practice tool for a race such as this. In your opinion, how much did that help you and what type of adjustments did you have to make once you realized, oh, hey, these aren't zeros and ones. These are real people with real emotions you're around. Yeah, I think the biggest difference was um, the draft wasn't as uh, profound as it was tonight. And uh, I will say the AI kicked my butt. Uh, they had, a, for whatever reason, they were able to save tires a ton better. So um i kind of came into tonight not expecting a lot so it was nice to see that all that practice with it did pay off but uh you know maybe i gotta turn them down a little bit so i, I might be competitive in that had to ask you a little bit about the contact between you and the 83 and adam benefield what happened there in the quad oval that was in the final stages of this race yeah i was um i was able to get to him uh before daniel got by both of us and i was trying to get the lead and we were just racing so hard and uh you know, the, the opportunity opened up. I was trying to pin him behind that lap car, and uh, I thought I held my line. I may have come up a little. He may have come down. I, I think it was a racing deal. I apologize to him. You know, that kind of ruined his night, and that's the last thing I want to do. So, uh, yeah, that's what I saw from my perspective. Mind you, it was also a fuel mileage race. Just curious, what was your fuel situation like? Because Everhart talked about he was thinking of topping off. What was your thinking process in that? Yeah, I was talking to everybody uh, under that caution. I was able to do 67 laps in the practice tonight. So I said, you're going to have to save a lap or two. And um, I, I noticed when we came off pit road, I was trying to coast the thing. I was shutting it off and I didn't, you know, not a lot of other people were doing that. So I think that they definitely gave me an advantage over everybody, but just not enough. Daniel was able to, to save and save tires enough and uh, he pulled out the win there. Mm -hmm. Now, next race on the calendar is going to be an interesting one because not only is it at Kansas, which just finished its official racing this week, it's going to be completely different potentially from what was seen in said week because adjustments to the tires, new damage model, adjustments to dynamic track, for example, mind you, new sound engine coming in as well. A lot of potential changes. Your thoughts on what to expect to see at Kansas? Yeah, I really don't know that track. Um, typically, is one lane around the top, and I've heard... Um at least through the AI, they're running the bottom. So maybe we'll be able to uh, spread out and run different lanes and everything else. So uh, the new damage model, it's going to make it interesting. If you tap the wall, maybe your car won't be okay. You know, um, I, I really haven't seen any videos of it. I'm excited to see what it is like tomorrow and uh, we'll see how it affects it. But yeah, I think, um, you know, you never know what these builds, you just got to uh, take it one day at a time. And, uh, you know, when we download it tomorrow, I'll definitely be practicing, trying to figure it out. Anyone you want to thank before we let you go? As always, you guys, best uh, best people in the business. Um, uh, everybody on um, Aegis, everybody low line for the Road to Pro, and um, all the fans are watching. That was a really good show from in the car. I hope everybody enjoyed it, and uh, my family for putting up with this hobby. Congratulations on the P2. I think your family is proud of you either way. Congrats. Thanks so much, guys. Andrew Freenosh coming away in P number two. Kyle Trudell was saving a ton, though, in P3. You were one of the biggest fuel savers of that entire green flag run. First of all, how are you feeling coming away with the P3 after so much clutch and coasting? Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, really good, actually. Uh, 
you know, of course, a little bit surprised. I think uh, I probably would have ended up P4, given that Scott ran out with about a lap to go. And, uh, you know, um, Adam looking like he, maybe him and uh, Andrew made a little contact. So I probably would have ended up P4, but, um, you know, I'll take the P3 anytime for sure. Now, what was your decision making when it came to that long, long green flag run to end the race, just about a lap or so outside the fuel number? Because most drivers were letting the car roll in in less on throttle time and apex off. You were going full clutch and coasting. Yeah, I figured um, I would have needed to save at least two laps um, as it was. And so I started saving right away under caution. And then we went green and, uh, you know, pretty much just tried to hold my own until I got into a spot where we single filed out and um, I could start saving. Um, but yeah, I was clutching it. Um you know, I wanted to use that technique just to be, make sure that I could make it um, and then hopefully try to go when the time was right. Um, but I think what I failed to do was was save my right front enough because um, I actually had about a little over a lap saved. Uh, so I saved quite a bit, too much. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the risks with clutch and coasting is burning up that right front with the extra speed, absolutely. But for the next race, Kansas, but it's after a new build. One of the main adjustments will be said tires that you were trying to keep cool down with the right front. Your thoughts on the expectations for Kansas, especially with an all new build coming. Should be really interesting, especially that, that track, you know, lends itself. We just had it uh, last week and uh, lends itself to being a, a top groove racetrack and a lot of slide jobs, things like that. So um, I think it'll be really interesting as long as the, if the tire is super different, then um, it's going to be a really interesting race next week. I'm looking forward to it. Anyone you want to thank before we let you go? I'll give a shout out to, uh, my brother and, uh, mom, family watching out there. My, my wife, uh, for giving the opportunity to, uh, spend a couple hours doing this and, um, and thank you guys for, for broadcasting and putting on a great race. Really, really fun to watch. Congratulations on bringing home that beautiful blue car in a P3 finish. Yeah, I appreciate it. That was Kyle Trudell coming home in third. Back over to you, Evan. I'd appreciate you talking a second and third because we now have updated points coming outside of this evening. Again, if you just go based solely on points and not the playoff positions, uh, Rhett McBride misses tonight. He falls four to seventh. Uh, you know, there's a lot of movement as well around the playoff cut line. But we mentioned Scott McClendon, Justin, even though it was a disastrous ending to the race as he falls to 12th, he still gains three spots in the points and he's going to be 13th. So that puts him above the cut line. Uh, that's a big up for him uh, and maybe gives him a positive to take out of this one when I'm sure he's feeling down after running out of fuel coming to the white flag. Yeah, he did very, very strong and solid tonight. If he had that extra lap of fuel, there's a chance I think he's the man who wins this race tonight because he played the cards very well. He On that last run, he looked like he had the better tires. He just didn't have enough fuel with how hard I think he was pushing for that race lead up in the final stages. Curious to see how he rebounds at Kansas. Eric Stanford drops a spot. He now is the bubble driver. Three points ahead of Michael Kaczynski. 17th of the points who gained two. Uh, big losses for Bobby Cheney and Grant Davis, who DNS this one. They both fall four spots. Cheney falling 21st in the points and Davis to 24th position. Of course, we continue on next Monday and we stick with the intermediates. Justin, we talked about how little of them that there are in the playoffs, but if you count this evening, one and a half mile racetracks make up uh, four of the next six races. You got Charlotte, Kansas. It is split apart by Sonoma, Pocono, and Indy, but the back to Kentucky and Chicagoland. Uh, so opportunities for drivers who are fans of these tracks to make up points now and again next race out Kansas next week on the 8th. Yeah, Kansas is going to be fun. It was talked about a little bit by Andrew. The bottom line came in by midweek. Drivers were trying both the bottom and the top line. So I think there's a chance we see multiple groups come in to play at different points of the run. I think the interesting race I think we both have a circle round two is Kentucky because, remember, that's the updated Kentucky coming in with the new iRacing build that has the different degrees of banking in turn three especially and the differences on the front stretch. 
And of course, not only are the tracks on that schedule changing to be updated, but these cars will be different. New damage model, that could affect how racing through damages, new tire updates as well. Going to be a very different look when we go racing even just next Monday. But until next time, that is it for us here tonight from Concord, North Carolina. On behalf of our entire team at RaceSpot TV and for your broadcast crew this evening, for our producer downstairs, our junior cocky Ponte, for Justin Prince, and myself, Evan Pasoko. want to thank you for tuning in and congratulate Daniel Eberhardt on race win number two on 2000. And 20. We are back next Monday night. You saw it for race number 12 for the Kansas Speedway. That race and every race of the 2020 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series, powered by Boosted, going to be found exclusively here on Race Spot TV. Until next time, good night from the Queen City. Thank you.